Sean, what are the uh, Star Trek figures you have over there in the background? I have Worf from Generations mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in his uh, in his holodeck costume. Very familiar, yes. And I have uh, Jordy from All Good Things. I okay, think I think it's All Good Things. Yeah. Yep. Yes. All right. I have both of those. Sure. No cash will be offered this day. <laughs> <laughs> no, my uh, uh, my son saw these at a yard sale or something, so he picked them up. Uh, now, Dave, have I ever told you that I have a um, a Captain S- like like season one Captain Cisco or Commander Cisco figure mm-hmm. uh, from the Deep Space Nine line, yet. Uh, the card that the that the figure is on it's carded as odo but the figure mm. is cisco yeah you, pack- you didn't tell me that oh, i remember pack- you telling you showed me that yeah i know um I, people try to act like on ebay it's like a collector's item and maybe it is slightly but there's a there's a voyager jane we going around with like a kess card <laughs> but yeah, I don't. I think those were in such uh, high circulation. Anyway, you see those all the time online. Yeah, right? like uh, they uh, make stuff overseas, and like they'll have a Superman, and it'll say Batman on the packaging or whatever. Oh yeah, those are good old bootlegs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What we're talking about is just playmates being inept. <laughs> <laughs> Just good old fashioned accidents. I'm looking forward to that shit too, because <laughs> it's coming back, and they're going to be I've, just as bad as they were. I yes. got a sign, Scotty, too. <laughs> oh, you get a Saru say, figure that says Sulu instead of Saru. Hmm. You have you said you said you have a signed Scotty. Yep, from Generations. Oh, nice, nice. I was actually wondering because, like, I had um, I had one on my wish list for the longest time. It was um one of the actually kind of rare um kind of rare um scotty in the gold uniform from uh where no man has gone before Uh and it was on ebay for the longest time and they all man it was signed by james Dewan, and i just kept wanting to go let me spend that 60 dollars let me spend that uh, no 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 it's weird that the generations uh scotty figure that the packaging says spock that's yeah, an, that is weird. That's an inside joke. That <laughs> I guess you guys, I, get I guess it. it went over your head. <laughs> I guess it, it, it wasn't it's inside of, but I wasn't there. And, it and didn't. You're, you're talking was, to a group of nerds. We had to remember to be polite and laugh. It yeah, was, and, and it was supposed check, to be the Leonard checkup figure. Yeah, and the checkup figure is carded as um, Doctor okay. Leonard Bones McCoy. Yeah, hmm. <laughs> I thought you were going to go for Admiral Pavel Chekhov. You know, making the. <laughs> I had a um, call back I, to Star Trek Four since I saw mm-hmm. Picard's doing this season. I had a signed copy of George Takei's uh, uh, biography, autobiography that um, got lost in a fire. Oh. Made me upset. It wasn't personalized or anything. I used to work at a bookstore, and a lot of times they would have signings at other stores. And then they would send us some of the copies that were left over from the signing to sell at our store. And it was one of those. And just, I found it on a sale table for like five bucks and it had a big sticker on it said autographed copy. And I opened it and it just had a signature. So I bought it. Wow. And I, I, I lived with my grandmother for a while. And then when I got married, I left a bunch of my stuff at my grandmother's house and then my grandmother's house burned down. So uh, I have um, a, if I have you find sign- another copy of the book, and you can get it to me, then maybe I can get that replaced for you. If I find another copy of the book, oh, an autograph. I was about to say, if I get if I get an autograph copy, you won't have to replace it for me. Oh no, just <laughs> I get you. get get a non autographed copy. Get it to me before uh, the end of August. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. What were you gonna say, Rick? I was. I, I've got a. I've got a, a copy of the. Uh... A book of Leonard Nimoy's poems that's signed by him, but it's like if I wasn't, it, it belonged to a friend of mine. She gave it to me. Uh, she gave me all her Star Trek shit, and it was in there. And I wow, just, I, I just you know, it, I'm I'm weird. I just you know, if I wasn't there, and if there's no, like I was in line to get an autograph from George Takei at a at a con once, and I was like, 
it, it, he's just sitting at a table. I'm going to be one face out of 10,000 that he's not going to remember. What's the point of this? And, and I, I left. I was like, I'm not going to do this. I've, I've often felt that way about autographs. Yet at the same time, now that I've purchased my gold level admissions package for uh, the Las Vegas con, I will cherish the 12 or 13 autographs that they include in the, in the package. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, I have a signed certificate from Beekman. Mm. You remember Beekman's world? Mm -hmm. yeah. I spent a day with Paul Zaloom because he was doing a show in my theater and he did like a morning show for the, for the young kids. And then he did an evening show for older kids. So he, he was with us all day. And that thing means more to me than any autograph I buy offline because I spent a day with the dude and he's really cool. And we had a great time. Um, I've got a, uh, somewhere I've got a, uh, a magazine, a Star Trek communicator magazine from the nineties. Stand by fellas. I'm still here. It had a bunch of, uh, one sheets in it. Like, I mean, this particular mm. issue just had one sheets of almost every character up to that point. And I think at that point they were up through deep space nine. And, um, I took it with me to a convention that we had at Birmingham and this is, this would be like 1994 or something like that. And, uh, I got Mark Leonard to sign his, um, his picture and it's in my closet somewhere, but there was a guy in front of me in, in line that had a poster from Star Trek generations that he was getting Mark Leonard to sign. Oh like, God. Why? <laughs> oh, oh, I have you beat about, uh, 25 years ago. I'm at the embassy suites in Montgomery where George Takei is signing autographs and this is montgomery alabama so two or three people ahead of me there's a guy going hey man what's up solo man you ever you ever go fishing you want to go man we gotta go fishing after this we gotta go fishing <laughs> let's go on over to Purtle's pond and you know george is like uh well uh, uh, i'm quite busy today uh, but, but perhaps some other time so that guy leaves the woman in front of me had a copy of Walter Keening's autobiography. Oh, God. And she's like, I just loved you. I just loved you so much. Hands it to him, and he just looks at it. <laughs> and I see him go, ah, thank you very much. <laughs> he just signs it. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going to make a really good impression. I was like 13. I'm like, I'll, I'll make a great impression on him because these assholes. Were <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere... Somewhere in Montgomery, I imagine, uh, there is a George Takei signed copy of Walter Keening's autobiography. And I have been scouring thrift stores whenever I get to back to Montgomery ever since looking for it. Do you think he might have signed it, Walter, just to fuck with her? Maybe. <laughs> I met, um, um, <laughs> I, I can't think of her name off the top of my head. Uh, Dynasty, uh, City on the Edge of Forever. Oh, uh Oh um, shit! Now it's gone out of my skull. Um, Joan yeah. Collins. Yeah, Joan Collins. Yes. Yeah. Joan Collins. <laughs> she wrote a book in the '90s. Uh, it was like a romance novel. She came to our store to sign it, and it was a big signing. There was a lot of people there, and That's I was huge. one of the ones uh, working the line. You know, uh, you know, letting people know when they could go through, and you had to buy at least one book to get mm -hmm. in line. Uh, if you bought a book and you got in line, you could you could ask her to sign one other thing. And um, this guy came through the line with her issue of Playboy oh. that she was in and said, will you sign this? And she said, I'll sign the cover, but do not open it. <laughs> <laughs> Out of curiosity, what percentage, what percentage of the people there would you say spelled like piss? I do not remember. <laughs> <laughs> It's like people who haven't gotten out of their house in like 45 years. Yeah, like, this was, I'll get out for that. This was when did Dynasty go off the air? Like early 90s. So this was not long after that. Yeah. And I was kicking myself because uh I had a VHS copy of City on the Edge of Forever and I forgot it and left it at home that mm. day. I was gonna get her to sign it. But all right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an all-new episode of That Star Trek Podcast, your place for a detailed analysis and speculation of all things Trek. My name is Sean, and I'm the guy that cried time cop and was wrong. Oh. <laughs> you and half the internet. 
joining me in the historic Infinite Potato Studio, we have Rick. How are you, sir? I want to believe. <laughs> Scott is here as well. How are you, sir? I took a wrong turn at World War G, and it took me forever to get back here. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Dave as well. How's it going, sir? Uh, my knees hurt. That's, <laughs> I don't have a funny quip. I'm just getting older, and I'd like to everyone to know it. <laughs> All right. Uh, right before, with you. <laughs> before we get started on um, on uh, Picard tonight, we have a strange new worlds update. They have released the titles and the TV guide esque blurbs for the first five episodes from season. Don't want to hear them. Don't want to hear them. Take your headphones off. All right. <laughs> no, I need to Not hear when them when you're done because I'm, I'm I'm taking a John Irons on this one. <laughs> I need to hear them because I'm just gonna I read them. I mean, build it up. I mean, we can we we can talk about them, but I'm just gonna read them. It's 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 the first five episodes. Episode one is called "Strange New Worlds." Captain Christopher Pike comes out of self-imposed exile to rescue an officer gone missing during a secret mission. Episode. I don't know two. why I'm worried. IMDb is never right about this stuff. This isn't IMDb. <laughs> this is. I mean, yeah, this was released from Paramount. Uh, um, mm -hmm. episode two is titled children of the comet an alien an ancient alien alien relic thwarts the enterprise crew from rewriting a comet on tr track to strike an inhabited planet i love a good thwarting <laughs> episode three is titled ghosts of illyria una must confront a secret she's been hiding when a contagion ravages the ship incapacitating the rest of the crew She's been drawing pictures of this dude all her life. And he shows up <laughs> and he's drawing pictures of her. Uh-huh. Episode four is called Memento Mori. Uh, it's not about Mori Povich. It's uh, Pike must Dream find... Stashed. It, it's one of the most overused titles in all of film and television. <laughs> uh, Pike must find unconventional Starfleet methods to deal with a malevolent force that attacks the Enterprise. Mm. And episode five is, is titled Spock Amok, Amok, Spock Amok. Uh, and it is uh, a personal visit causes a comedy of errors during Spock and Pike's crucial negotiations with an unusual alien species. And so that's, that's the first five episodes. Of, that's the, and it does seem fairly episodic. <laughs> now, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's the 21st century. There's going to be some kind of a through plot that's going to connect everything, but it seems like it's uh, fairly, fairly episodic from the from those uh, descriptions. Anyway, I gotta I am... say, I gotta say, the children of the of the comet is perhaps the most TOS title I've ever heard since TOS. Yeah, that uh, that whole that whole uh, TV guide type uh, blurb seems like they just described about four next generation episodes two deep huh. space nine episodes and an episode of the orville <laughs> yeah so i'm trying my very best as i do with all of these shows to not get my hopes up to not start speculating because i mean and i don't mean to you know pat myself on the back or anything but i do think i come up with more compelling story ideas than what they actually do <laughs> so like i started thinking like oh they've got to do this oh they've got it and then they don't and i'm like ah. <laughs> that's why i've always loved the novels man because i mean especially like that um um the destiny trilogy i mm -hmm. mean it's got everybody from the entire uh saga and you, know, you know all of star trek in, in yeah. these novels you know uh okay well, I just re remember did you ever do that peter davidson interview peter davidson you mean peter david and yeah. uh, I, I assume he's talking about peter david and no we did not get a peter david uh interview I, yeah i've i've written him us. many times and he okay. never now i did chat with um who's peter peter davidson was a doctor who never mind <laughs> i did chat with uh davidson, i had to pull it up yeah. pull it back up on my twitter but um one one of the writers of the uh of a star trek series and scott and i were talking about doing a doing a uh series of episodes where we talked about novels but we never got around to actually starting it but i had one of the writers he said that he would 
be interviewed when we got to his book, but we haven't got to it yet. So <laughs> it's still happening. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Michael Jan Friedman because it's. Well, no, that's no, what no, I'm thinking no. of. Not Peter David, Michael Jan Friedman. We were supposed, oh. we, we did, we talked to him once about, um, we talked to him once and then we we're going to do a couple other books that I hadn't read. And I said, and I was going to, I was going to tap out on that one. Cause I, I just, I, yeah, I was we haven't gotten time. We haven't gotten back to the books because they started releasing all the star Trek stuff, mm -hmm. like a, a year's worth of it. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's why we haven't finished our time travel series and all that, you know, cause it just, uh, I was looking in my email to see. Still awesome. We talked to Alan Dean Foster. That was, that was, yeah, yeah. That, that was good. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So, um, Tonight, we will be discussing the eighth episode of Star Trek Picard's second season, which was titled Mercy, written by Cindy Appel and Kirsten Beyer and directed by Joe Menendez. With time running out before the launch of the Europa mission, Picard and Guinan must free themselves from FBI custody. Seven and Rafi come face to face with Gerardi and the horror of what she's become. What'd you guys think of this I episode? Th I, oh, I thought you said horror for a second. Was, <laughs> <laughs> the whore, the horror that untrue. she has become. It's like, look, the dress is flattering, but let's not go that far. I, I like the boots. I think they work really well with the dress. Yeah, that was hot. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what'd you think? No what'd you think of the episode? <laughs> I'm not kink shaping, man. I'm agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> what? What'd you think of the episode? Um, it was fine. It was, you know, I enjoyed the, uh, the guy and stuff, uh, specifically the, I have to admit, I, I was disappointed that this was what felt like it did. It felt like a, a Fox Mulder ripoff character rather than, you know, uh duquesne from voyager mm -hmm. that would have been way cooler and also it just like so where the hell are the temporal fleet why have we not seen them ever again after voyager like did they just do something on voyager that made the temporal fleet not happen um i thought it would have been a great opportunity to 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 bring uh that mythology back into the franchise especially since you know it was a wells class vessel that the relativity was it's was just so good and the, nope it's just because he was on another terry metalla show and he was obsessed with wells hg wells on that show yeah they okay that, that's what he oh. said so he so he said the, okay so the whole thing is that uh this guy J jay carnes played agent wells in this episode he played lieutenant duquesne in relativity mm -hmm. He flew a Wells class ship in that episode. So obviously people are going to think, oh, well, Agent Wells, Wells class ship and all this kind of stuff. And then Metallus comes back and says, no, it's because he was on 12 Monkeys and he uh, and he was obsessed with H.G. Wells. That's why I called him Agent Wells. Nah, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're trying no, to. That's only like the trying third to go both time ways. Sean has sworn on microphone, so you know this is pissing him off. <laughs> it, you know, it's it's it, it was it, stunt, it was stunt casting. It was stunt casting, but it was a it was a big red herring. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was it something was to get us to talk. You know, it, yeah, it was designed to fuel the speculation, and then it just, it it didn't pay it off. I think, I think it would have been you know better for all concerned if they had gone ahead and paid it off. It, you know, they don't have to turn the entire season on who this guy is just mm -hmm. some some reference that says you know he can however they have to you know massage the writing so it ends where it ended him giving the communicator back letting them go but also you know dropping a little hint saying you know drop me a line when you get to the 29th century flash okay, that then. flash that sideways uh, uh you know relativity era um Com badge and off you go. Continue yeah. on. They need to massage this writing because that shit is like all knotted up. It's like <laughs> it's not. It's clunky as shit. <laughs> anyway, right. Scott, um, what did you think? Um, I, overall, I thought it was fine. Um, the issue that I tend to have throughout uh, the whole of the season, and and I do have to apologize. I'm still um, 
It's it's not a problem with the show. It's a problem with my software that I'm using to get my podcast. It has a hard time with certain sources, which means I'm having a lot of trouble downloading this show to listen to it for the weeks when I'm not here. Uh, so I don't know if this is something that you guys have mentioned before uh, in any way, but I think what's holding me up the most when I'm watching these new episodes of Picard is I want them to spend more time and go into more detail to really dig into anything and everything that harkens back to you know previous Trek. Um, I, I want that that deep, comprehensive fan satisfaction of you know I, I want them to really give us a, a solid explanation of who Gary Seven was and and who uh Thalon is now and yes he mentioned you know Gary Seven Kirk's Enterprise and Kirk's Enterprise again he's mentioning he seems to have a, a real a real love on for Kirk's Enterprise well he met uh, him. well if lower decks is any indication we, they all do oh yeah, yeah that's true yeah <laughs> um the, the the meeting between Guinan and Q yeah maybe I won't be satisfied unless they say un, un, unless Q says to to Guinan you haven't met me yet, but I've met you. And I remember there was a time on the Enterprise and you put your hands up like this and I didn't do something to you. And it was really weird because it looked like we knew each other and this is why or whatever. I want mm -hmm. them to give us all the explanation. <laughs> but we get scenes like this where characters meet and we have an opportunity for fan questions to be answered, questions that we've had for years, for decades answer this question, give us the backstory, tell us what we've been dying to know for so long. And the scene is made up of wall-to-wall, -wall, vague and cryptic dialogue that not only doesn't give us the backstory that we've been craving for so long, but it doesn't even necessarily clearly lay out the plot they're trying to tell in the season. Well, you know why they're cryptic though, right? Because when they did shit like on Enterprise where they explained the Klingon ridges, the fans were pissed. Yeah, because it was stupid. <laughs> yeah, but that's my point. The yeah. fans will think every explanation is stupid because there is nothing they could do that will be as great as whatever bullshit we cooked up in our own heads. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you have you been watching Doctor Who, Scott? Um, I'm I'm a little behind. I think that I didn't make. I don't think that I've finished the last full season, and I know they they just put out a special, right? Yeah. Okay, so, I haven't seen the that, special. That word is so not appropriate for what they put out last week. But I, I haven't seen that. And how how long mm. was the was the prior season? Was it like a was it, it was like, it like a miniseries? Eight episodes, I think. It, yeah, it it was not. It was they, it was supposed to be long. Well, uh, let's not go down that rabbit hole. We don't have a whole lot of time. But uh, yeah, it was like eight episodes that were supposed to be longer, but they weren't. The, but the reason I bring it up, not not to get too into the weeds on Doctor Who is that you can one of by the, the way things, huh? you can by the way yeah I, well, believe me. <laughs> I <can't, I> know. <laughs> i'm here um, for it <laughs> one of the things chibnall has done in his tenure here is exactly what you're asking for and it has been annoying as hell is rewriting the lore and trying to put his stamp on the entire history of the doctor and 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 it's it's awful it's awful and it's terribly done and it's it's like oh now you know this and we're like who cares you know it's like the whole thing with the doc the name of the doctor is like his name is either bob and we won't care or it's you know 44 syllables long and we still won't care because it won't mean anything it's you know i like like you said like at the end of the matrix the first matrix movie when Neo says, you know, and you'll, you'll never know where I'm coming, and he hangs up the phone and he flies away, that was the perfect ending to an almost perfect movie, mm -hmm. and they never should have done another one because nothing could live up to what my imagination had for Neo after that. And then mm -hmm. they did three more movies that were absolute disappointments. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of cool with them not answering <laughs> questions specifically. I'm just getting a little sick of the meandering around and not going anywhere. Well, see, like the name of the doctor stuff was always really interesting. And I love the way they resolved that with, well, my original name doesn't matter. It's the name that I chose. That was really poignant. And I really loved that. I am not caught. I have not watched any Jodie Whittaker. I couldn't get a hold of 
you know the the special they did where where he became Jodie Whittaker so for a long time and then you know I got married and my wife has was trying to catch up so we, we haven't gotten to any Jodie but um from what I understand they're doing a lot of I mean it doesn't sound like his stamp it sounds like you know old book stuff like timeless child stuff the other and and, and cartmill master plan stuff so maybe i don't know i've not i, I haven't read any of that stuff so i i only go but uh, i've only seen what's been on the screen now there have been good episodes and you know we've i've been lamenting all along i've been I've, i'm occasionally on a doctor who podcast go shit go figure um <laughs> and we've been lamenting ever since chibnall and jody took over is that she is incredible and is being completely wasted by mm. Chibnall's inability to, you know, write worth a shit. I thought Chibnall was an interesting choice. And by that, I meant, oh, really? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Russell it's, T. Davies is coming back. So let's just hang in there. Get it, through it with the Jody an stuff. unconventional choice. I mean, i big fan of Chibnall with Broadchurch. Apparently, mm-hmm. it does not translate to, to genre fiction and sci-fi like Doctor Who. No, well, Broadchurch season time one will not be remembered fondly. True. The other seasons Two. of Broadchurch was meh. I didn't yeah, make I, it. I didn't make it through Flux. I mean, I I got to like the last couple episodes, and I was like, man, this is confusing. Is yeah, I don't even know what's and, going and on. Yeah. He's... Flux is is where I still stand. It yeah, it's not like I was disliking it. It's just I have to say that nothing of the of the current Doctor has grabbed me the way that previous Doctor Who has grabbed me. I, even even uh, Capaldi was sometimes a little bit iffy for me, but oh, Capaldi but I got had some it. of the worst episodes ever. I mean, Pyramid yeah. at the End of Time or whatever that one was called. What was weird about Capaldi is he was my favorite Doctor, but he had some of the worst episodes. Yeah. Like I don't, oh, God, it was but so disappointing. Bill, <laughs> the saving grace of, of Capaldi's era was Bill. I loved Bill so much. Mm-hmm. Bill was fantastic. Anyway, you, you, this you is Star Trek. Yeah, let's talk about Star Trek. <laughs> what, what was what was really interesting about that was Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, if Enterprise season five had happened, we probably would have gotten that crossover with with Russell T Davies, yeah. Doctor Who. So <laughs> it all connects, y'all. <laughs> so uh, so Picard and Guinan are locked up in the basement of a facility somewhere, and uh, Wells has them down there, and we see some. We see some handcuffs on the table that have blood on them. A few minutes later, there's no yeah, blood. Yeah, they never explain that. The blood uh, disappears. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, and I kind of, I was thinking about this Wells thing. Um, and I was wondering if, so we've seen a lot of people in this season of Picard that in this past are playing different versions of themselves or they're playing other people even though it's this person so we we see soji but it's not soji it's somebody else we see data but it's not data it's somebody else we see uh laris but it's not laris it's somebody else and i have kind of hinted toward thinking that this is some kind of wizard of oz type thing going on with picard but i'm wondering if it could be not picard but just in general people are people are other people you know maybe this is uh duquesne but he's not duquesne he's he's wells now you know or something like Mm -hmm. that it would be interesting because i say that because picard never met duquesne he he, this was that was a voyager episode so um it would be interesting if some other characters that had popped up on star trek series that picard wasn't a part of pop up i know we've only got two episodes left but and but they're yeah. playing well, other people. i've been i've been saying all along that you know re- it's clear that reality is mal- malleable in whatever's going on and you know i on the one hand if they do a you know uh bobby ewing coming out of the shower you know at, in the last episode kind of thing and like none of this ever happened i'll be pretty pissed off about it but I would love to see some sort of reveal at the end that ties up all of the inconsistencies. Well, I think y'all, this is going to carry over into season three. That's what I was going to ask. If, if you guys think that the, the, they will have a resolution of sorts that is going to tie up quite a bit of season two, but whatever they're doing here and where it ends 
is positioning them for what comes next in season yeah. three, rather than a essentially a completely unconnected story like this is compared to season two. Well, John Delancey is season one. John Delancey is supposed to be in season three, and I would find it hard to believe that they just have a whole nother Q story, you know, mm-hmm. and that uh, I would think it would be a continuation of this. Now, I will get ticked off if they bring up all these legacy TNG characters back and they're all playing different people in the past. <laughs> oh, God. Don't no, say I, that. I think... <laughs> I, no, here, I don't think I had heard um, that Delancey was going to be in season three. And if you're saying that he is, that makes me very happy because uh, we know that they are... Uh, they have filmed season three of Picard to be it, the final season for, for this show. Mm-hmm. And if they're bringing back all the uh, the original uh, TNG cast for this in a Q story, then that gives me a, a lot of hope and a lot of good feelings because mm-hmm. that that tells me that the showrunners and the writers are very intentionally setting up this character finale, not just for Picard, but for all the TNG characters. Mm-hmm. They're setting up their finales to end with a q bookend they're they're gonna i would love to see them go to farpoint station i would love season three to take us to farpoint at least no for, i don't want it even for just like a visit well farpoint station was like a bunch of a couple of aliens or an alien wasn't it it was like a jelly space jellyfish so i mean mm-hmm. it doesn't even exist anymore Nothing says they could have <clears throat> built an actual structure in, in its place. It doesn't have to mm-hmm. function the same way, but yeah. yeah Damn it, it grappler zorns at it again. <laughs> he imprisoned the another alien. Still alive. The, the guy who played uh, Grappler Zorn? Yeah, wasn't it like Larry Storch or his grandfather's? Um, Even if he is, no, that was, the I know it wasn't Larry him. Storch. I'm kidding. No, the, those, those, <laughs> that was Michael Bell, the voice of Duke from G.I. Joe. <laughs> mm. From the original 80s G.I. Joe cartoon. Yeah, the voice of Duke was Michael Bell. That was that was Zorn. But I they still around. needlessly recast. Um, oh God, what was his name? Now I can't remember his name. Guy that um, you're being waved at. Guy you that um, you, but... okay. Good night. Did... Bruce Maddox. They recast him for no reason at all. Yeah. So well, because why would they, they care? A, because the, the original actor isn't, isn't acting anymore. anymore. Yeah, he, he's a teacher now. He doesn't. Yeah, uh, he's not he, acting. Anymore. He doesn't. Yeah, but he probably asked him and he was like, no. Yeah. No, no. He said they didn't even contact him. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. He, yeah, he said he would have done it. Hmm. Oh, that's surprising. That's, yeah. And unfortunate. And, you know, I'm wondering if if the whole uh, uh, Duquesne thing might have been similar to the uh, uh, Nick Locarno, Tom Paris thing where somebody was like, we're not paying that dude, that writer again. Mm. that's that's the reason i think that's pretty much the reason why season one of picard they never actually said aromatic syndrome or whatever it is that he had you know they just said you know that brain thing you have Mm. (laughs) which i don't get fair play because you know picard's budget is like one episode costs more than a whole freaking season of tng i don't know why they're penny pinching if that is the case (laughs) well from what i understand um michael shaban i read an interview where he was saying that you know at some at the end of all good things beverly did see that in his brain but said it could become several different things you know and they didn't want to do aromatic syndrome again because it had already been done and done so well in all good things this is they wanted to kind of skew away from that but still have them be impaired. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about this uh, this meeting between Q and Guinan. So best um, scene of the episode. They they separate Picard from Guinan. They put them in in separate rooms, and uh, and Q shows up, but he's wearing an FBI uh, jacket. He's I guess he's undercover, and he says, "You're the one that summoned me." So when she summoned him last week, it did work. It's just. Q doesn't have any power, so he couldn't just appear. He had to, he had to do it the manual way. He had to walk there. <laughs> so, um, I kind of uh, feel like Q was just like the dean on Community. He just likes costumes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I don't understand, it, and this this may be another rabbit hole, but like he he, yeah, it was me. What the fuck? No way. Um, trying to trying to get the movie for 
anyway, my iPad's being weird. Um, Q doesn't have his powers, yet he sure as hell can get places and get inside things <laughs> and like come in as an FBI agent. Hey, you put on an FBI jacket, not a whole lot of people are going to ask you why you're wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he might not FBI. have teleportation powers. Maybe he just has like a little bit of a Jedi mind trick. Ah, okay. Yeah, I was. I, was I don't know. That. I was maybe he's he... maybe he's got a little bit of the doctor's uh, psychic paper. I mean, he's very <laughs> he's very good at programming things. Like he's still like smart as hell. Apparently. Oh, yeah, the the scene the scene where uh, I want I keep wanting to call her Soji, but I know that's not her name in this up in this Korea or something like that. Yeah, or, the scene Korea. where she puts on the <laughs> VR thing and she and she's looking at the video from <clears throat> from twenty years ago or whatever it is. And Q is in that video. I thought that scene was pretty cool. Except that, you know, it's supposed to be 2024 and I don't see us having that kind that kind of tech. Yeah. I was like, in what two years? What damn century is this supposed to be in? I mean, I know we have VR technology, but I can't take I can't take a VR helmet and just say, show me my old home videos and put me in them. <laughs> yeah. Convert this 2D image to a 3D model. It, yeah. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, it's um, Sung's laboratory. He's got all kinds of nifty shit that nobody else does. Well, I guess if he had had video in uh, enough video of the lab through all of his different files, it could just sort of grab from reference and create a 3D model. Maybe. But yeah, I went from from like in a span of about two seconds, went from this is dumb to eh, you know, blacklist does this kind of shit. And we don't <laughs> yeah. question it, you know. Well, I but question I did, it, but I did think it was cool that, <laughs> that Q was in in the video and she was able to see him and talk to him in real time and everything. But he was he was in a video from the past. It was almost it was like a paranormal activity kind of thing mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he had inserted an, an uh you know an ai digital version of himself into the program that could act just like he would act in the same way that uh soon had placed um you know a fully interactive ai version of himself <clears throat> inside juliana tainer's uh uh matrix it None of it makes sense. They just make this stuff up as they go. The thing with Q, I think that we should remember, though, as far as, you know, how is he still able to be someone's psychiatrist and he's part of the Europa mission and he's just walking through the FBI. He did point out when he lost his powers in, uh, help me out, which episode was it? Q who? No, uh, no. Uh, suddenly Q, no, suddenly not suddenly human. That was you talking about old stuff or this uh, season? T TNG, he shows up. Uh, uh, he's been, yeah, it was Q who? Yeah, no, Q, Q, Q who, us, maybe. I thought Q who was season two when they met the Borg. Um, then it was. Uh, I think Deja, 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 Deja Q. Deja Q might be the one. Yeah, yeah. The, the, when the continuum depowers him, he yeah. still has the, stabs him with a fork. Yeah, he still has the IQ that he had before mm -hmm. he lost his powers, which he yeah. states as two thousand and five. So, if he is still as intelligent as he was before losing his powers maybe not quite as intelligent he, he does seem to be uh kind of losing a bit of his mental grip uh compared to the cue that we've seen before but he's still got to be wicked smart and probably yes has a bit of um uh you know, he, he he can roll a, a natural 20 for charisma pretty much whenever he wants <laughs> he can just talk his way yeah. into places i'm sure so um guinan figures out that he's dying which we've we kind of figured that from the first time that he showed up this season, he kind of insinuated that, that there was something wrong. Um, but he says that, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of looking forward to going into the, the next stage or whatever, the unknown, but then it didn't happen. And now he's just kind of disappearing or whatever. So uh, Guinan is asking him, is that why you brought Picard back to the past? And it's like, I didn't bring Picard back to the past. You know, I said this before. And it's like, he didn't bring him to the past. He brought him to another reality. And then Picard went back to the past on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, so then he says this, he says this line where humans are always trapped in the past. And then Guinan displays a power that we've never seen her do before. Uh, where she like, telepathically projects herself into the room where Picard is and says those words 
and makes Picard instantly know what he needs to do next or whatever. That 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 kind of was uh I don't want to say Deus Ex Max and uh, it was it wasn't quite that, but it was pretty convenient that they say, Oh, now Gani can do this. And then she's gonna say these words and Picard's gonna know exactly what to do, you know. But it did yeah. make her nose bleed, which is yeah. universal television for this was really hard, and that's why you haven't seen them do it. Yeah, and probably I won't see them do it again. I don't do this much because it hurts. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. You know, this is this is the same argument that we hear every time we meet somebody's a family member that wasn't mentioned before you know we saw uh, okay Guinan was on the show for a few seasons but if you put together all of the time we spent with Guinan on screen i'll bet it was less than an hour Mm -hmm. so her having powers that we don't know is not it's no there we haven't seen her do it before but she also hasn't had any need to do it before yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, the only reason that she had a need to do it was because they needed her to do something in this episode. Her power could have, I mean, they could have made her do anything and we okay. could be having the same argument. <laughs> yeah, but we never, we okay, we never saw a member of the Enterprise crew in any series take a dump, but they could do it, right? <laughs> Not according to that okay. Ook with a Mock song, but <laughs> to, I mean, to be I, fair, I, to that, be is, fair. that is childish, I will grant you, but it's still... <laughs> Just because we haven't seen someone do something before doesn't mean that it's it's you know pulling it out of their ass. Pardon my friend, my connection there to see it now. In all fairness, that I'll remind you how forgiving function. you're being when you when the next Ant Man movie comes out. Yeah, fuck Ant Man. <laughs> <laughs> I like Ant Man. This is Paul Rudd. Talk about chemistry charisma oh just oh anyway uh yeah no uh in fairness this is exactly the way they used Guinan in the next generation just whenever they needed somebody with a spooky power to deliver some kind of bullshit yeah. information that picard needs it's like Guinan can do this now <laughs> oh yeah so like, oh she's got time sickness she knows that yesterday's enterprise is different you know it's always something with her so <laughs> <laughs> well, it, le- it leads into uh, Picard figuring out or, or getting Wells to tell him that he had a childhood encounter with some Vulcans. Of course, mm-hmm. Wells didn't know that they were Vulcans. And one of the Vulcans tried to do a mind meld with him to make him erase the memory of meeting them. And he thought he was trying to pull his brain out of his head or whatever. And it, yeah. it, tra- it traumatized him forever and made him think that all aliens are evil and all this kind of stuff. I and- did like that that crossed over with Enterprise. It didn't. It did. It, that that wasn't they said carbon that, creep. That wasn't carbon. It, it creep. wasn't. It wasn't carbon creep. But on carbon creep, they said that Vulcans wouldn't be on Earth again until this time, and that is the time that. I guess. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're right about that. But I've I've seen a lot of people saying, <laughs> "Oh, this was car- this this was carbon creep, and that was to Paul's yeah. grandmother." It's like, no, it wasn't. Oh. That they would have to be seventy five years old. <laughs> no, but it, it but they did mention on Enterprise that Vulcans wouldn't be back until this time, and then yeah, they yeah, you're right about that. With, but I, I just I just yeah. kind of assumed that Vulcans had been kind of in and out for you know centuries before. Which, but or Terry Metalis, Terry Metalis was apparently a production assistant on Enterprise at the time. Yeah, so, that so he sense. was he was already setting things in place for this season of Picard. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> <laughs> under his guidance. This show will become lost. You know, <laughs> just oh, the connectivity, but no answers. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's kind of telling uh, that while we have touched on certain things that happened in this episode, we barely talked about it. We've been talking about almost everything but this episode. Mm -hmm. And while I enjoyed it when I was watching it, and I don't think that it was badly written, uh, this this whole season has just been kind of fluffy. And and there there hasn't been any, like, I thought about trying to rewatch the episode before before we, we, uh, we convened this evening, because I've had I've had a really weird ass weekend. Um, and I just, I just was like, eh. yeah, I, I couldn't be bothered. 
the task seemed insurmountable. <laughs> well, it, it just seemed, <laughs> why bother? I, yeah. and, and that's not how I want to feel about Star Trek. I don't think things are badly written. I mean, if this wasn't Star Trek, I mean, I think the, 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 the craft is fine. You know, if this was not Star Trek, if this was just some show, I think it would be fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like uh, Nemesis. People, you know, Nemesis isn't a bad movie. It's a bad Star Trek movie. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think it's a bad movie. Well, yeah, yeah, that may be a bad choice. A bad, <laughs> bad example. Um, oh, okay. Into Darkness. A bad Into Darkness is not a bad, is a bad movie. bad movie, too. Uh, Into Darkness is not a bad movie. It's a terrible, in my opinion, Star Trek movie. You know, if everything that happened in 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 Into Darkness was just we're going to make a, a sci-fi film, I'd have been, it, it would have been fine. It was just it shat on so much Star Trek lore, um, and was like, why do you put those people in torpedoes? And anyway, um, I don't think that, and, and I'm bringing this up because we've had this discussion on on Facebook today. Um, I, I don't think we're looking at, you know, lazy or bad writing and no, Bueling, you didn't say lazy. I know I'm not, I'm not putting those words in your mouth. Um, I just, I don't know what they're doing with it. And I, you know, and you know, we've got two episodes left and hopefully there will be something that ties this all together because if the ending is awesome, then all of this will, will, and, and, it, and it ties it all up and it makes sense then I'll be happy to go, oh, that's what they were doing. But right now, if a meteor fell on Paramount tomorrow and we didn't see the last two episodes, I wouldn't be that upset about it. I, I think what they're doing, and what, what my main problem is, is, I mean, it's not a terrible show or anything. It is, so far, a much better ending than Nemesis provided us. Yeah. Um, and happy as hell we're getting the the... The crew back and honestly i thought the show was pretty good uh up until metallus left to go do season three so but i think my primary issue with picard has been they are throwing away opportunities and where, where they could really do something really interesting and tie up stuff for us and they're just not doing it like i, I think it's problematic when the whole of the internet sees the same shit and goes, Oh, this, they've got to be doing this. And they get really excited about it. And they're like, Nope, we're not doing anything near as imaginative as that. Yeah. Nothing is clever. Nothing is compelling. It's literally just going to be, you know, agent Mulder. Yeah. Okay. okay that sucks. <laughs> it just well, does. It, it, it's also, you know, Stuart had said, had, had been saying for years that he saw no reason to, to, to revisit Picard because he'd said all he had to say mm -hmm. and he wasn't going to come back unless it was something really special mm -hmm. and looking at what they've done thinking from an actor standpoint I can certainly see why he came back for it because he's getting to do all kinds of stuff Picard never could but that doesn't necessarily make for compelling Star Trek it makes for mm -hmm. something fun for him mm -hmm. yeah and you know I'm not sitting there rolling my eyes watching the episode but afterwards, I'm like, do we really care <laughs> about baby Picard and his mom running through the labyrinth of the mind? Um, yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Maman! Uh, no, I, I, yeah, I, I haven't seen anything as compelling in this season or in last season that was as compelling as those, like, few, like, stolen seconds of Kirk coming to terms with his mortality in Star Trek II of him coming to terms with the fact that he was a negligent father, that he's never, you know, really faced death. Like all of that stuff is, it was because it was also a commentary on what we had seen before. And like, yes, he was the brash captain who cheated death and did all this great stuff, but you know, he was kind of an, he was just kind of an asshole. He was a negligent dad. He, you know, all these things like where you're just like, Oh shit, he's got all these flaws and makes him a really compelling character. I haven't seen really any of this except, you know, it's kind of interesting, but that Picard's dad was maybe abusive. Maybe his mom had some issues uh, mentally, but eh, it's, they dragged it out to a point where I just feel like just get to it, man. Yeah, just, let's get to an interesting like they they haven't balanced it well. They haven't balanced like the character drama well with 
the the storyline. And I think as a fan, I want to see both. Like I need those poignant character moments, but I also want like questions answered. I want things tied up. I want to see Sayla again. I want to see all these things from the next generation <laughs> that were like teased. Like I want to see those aliens that you know <laughs> never took over starfleet um yeah i don't know i'm just i it is it is difficult to be a fan and to have your own and and what's worse is to be a fan who is creative because so many fans of star trek i find are very creative and they love this universe but they all have seemingly better ideas of what should be happening than what they've presented to us you know what I, what I, the, the impression I almost get, and I didn't really, it didn't dawn on me until you were just talking about what you were just saying. I wonder if there's like, we, we know that the writers are fans. Yeah. We know they know the shit we know. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if they keep getting pulled back from above saying, no, no, you know, Joe, Joe Q public isn't going to get that. And so mm -hmm. they're only being allowed to go so far. And it's like farther than, you know, a non-fan is gonna is going to be comfortable with, but it's nowhere near what we want. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. I wonder. Yeah, that's. Yeah, they won't. They they won't let them go so far into the weeds that the 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 audience is gonna feel like they have to go do homework to understand what's going on. Uh, we've been doing I, homework for fifty I can years. Understand that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about uh, let's talk about the Girardi thing for a few minutes because we we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, um, so. Seven and Rafi, this whole storyline that they've got going on with Seven and Rafi in this episode, uh, kind of covers it covers a couple of things. Seven finally tells Rafi, "Hey, you know, you manipulate people. You know that." <laughs> and we find out that Rafi, the reason that she's really upset about Elnor is because she manipulated him into staying at Starfleet. She didn't want to lose him. She didn't want to go away. She didn't want him to go away, and so he stayed. And now he's dead. You know, mm -hmm. so so that's really or causing her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'll be back. Uh, I, I hope be, not. <laughs> I think I'm with Dave. I think I'd be okay if he if he didn't actually survive. And I'd be okay with it. I don't part, partly, think it's gonna happen. <clears throat> partly due to the fact that I really did not find myself uh, uh, compelled by his character in in season one. He's. It didn't really give him much to do other than you know. Hack other than kill a lot of folk yeah he should have been killed a lot of choose folk. to live i will disagree <laughs> with that i loved his character the please my friends choose to live like ah that's so badass i dig it um but i desperately need for them to have stakes yeah i can't i can't i hate it when they just bring people back for no reason just like oh mm -hmm. well, it, no, no. time no, no no i hate that i hate it <laughs> no but, um, Ra Ra rafi's uh manipulation I don't know. Something about that just didn't really sit right with me because really I, it, seven really called her out as you, you know, you're, you're a manipulative person. You manipulate people to get mm -hmm. what you want all the time. And what's the example they show us? Rafi hits him with like a, a mid-level guilt trip and walks away. And that's the big reveal of, Oh, she's so manipulative. Well, he's an emotional child, you know? He, yeah. Yeah. That that rang true for me. I know people yeah, like that. I, in my she life. had she had family issues with. I mean, she's already lost one family because of bad decisions that she made before, mm -hmm. and now she's considering him to be her family, and she doesn't want to lose another family. She doesn't want. I well, I mean, she considers the entire group to be her family, and she wants that group to stay together. You know, but I liked I that reveal because I liked that reveal because. We had not really seen her be very manipulative. We just kind of went, God, her son's a dick from season one. And now we're just like, oh, no, she's kind of an awful person. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, she played Picard from the minute she met him. Mm hmm. She did. Yeah. She, you know, J, the whole JL thing is like, this is Jean Luc freaking Picard. Even his, you know, even his best friend, Will Riker, won't call him Jean Luc. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know it's it's it, so you know I, I i would watch the hell out of a out of a raffi seven sitcom <laughs> i, I love i love the chemistry between those two and i don't like sitcoms but I, I think that would be a great 
I would agree, but I haven't spent the fifteen dollars to listen to that audio they did. But, I have it, so. and I have it listened to it. Scott. Scott Wait, and I what? are going to Scott and I are going to do an episode uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, about it. I haven't listened to it yet. I have. What, it, what are you talking about? The audio the no drama Man's Land. That, that they did uh, with Rafi and Seven. It's like a no fin- did one. It yeah, takes place fin- before this season. It takes place between season one and season two. And it's fifteen bucks. Yes, yeah, fifteen. Bucks it's on Audible. So... You can get it on Audible if you have an Audible credit. Yeah. You can get it. Oh, okay. It's a uh, Fenris Rangers Ooh. adventure with Rafi and Seven. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, li- listen to it, and then you can uh, be on I the episode. I, I don't. I don't do that shit. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that, but I'm not going to listen to it. I hate. He doesn't do that homework. <laughs> well, is it, it okay? At the risk of using the c word, is it canon or is it fan? Is it just? Uh... It is. Who canon cares? until they say it's not it is in the universe is everything i <laughs> care <laughs> it's a fun adventure and it has and it has jerry ryan and uh, michelle, michelle heard. yeah michelle heard. <clears throat> i'm pretty sure that with uh any you know books audiobooks um uh, any what would what used to be considered beta <laughs> canon i'm pretty sure that they are con- they're writing all this stuff from the standpoint of we're going to consider it canon. This is building out from, mm-hmm. from the shows did, that we're making. Did you read Desperate Measures? No. That was the first Discovery uh, novel. Um, I made Which was guess. immediately contradicted by season two of Discovery. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I, I bought the, the thing and I listened to it. It was the first novel, first Star Trek novel I had read in decades. And they were like, oh, we talked to the writers and we made sure this was all cool because, and I've explained this before. This is not a, this is not a personal choice. My brain does not accept. And this is why I don't read novels. I have, I I am a canonista knee jerk. I don't want to be, but I'm listening, you know, whenever I read the novels, my, my mind was going, and this is the stupidity of it. This isn't real. None of it's freaking real. (laughs) <laughs> but i have you know i've it, it it just doesn't you know because the you know what happens on screen is the only stuff that's quote-unquote real to me i i have the same or i had the same problem but may i present to you this argument sure the multiverse is quote-unquote real within star trek canon so if something is contradictory from the books to the screen that means that book happened in a parallel reality that's very close to the one we know you haven't so heard me talk about parallel. It all reality. happens. It all happens. Yeah, I mean, it's I the same, mean, it's the same way we, we can enjoy the uh, the Abrams universe movies. Yeah, because I mean, they're not canon, but they still happened. Hey, They've one of my in canon, and one they are my... bringing. I'm sorry, Dave. They're bringing. Oh, you're good. They're bringing lots of lots of stuff from the novels. They're just showing up in the series all the time. Yeah, yeah. and as soon as it yeah. happens, I love it. It's great. Um, you know, I want Mara Jade in Starfleet. I'll be down with that. <laughs> I I want this this kid playing this guy playing uh, Kirk in Strange New Worlds. I want to see his own spinoff series where he's playing Captain Kurt from the old UK British comics. You know, like this, <laughs> Captain Kurt and, and, and Doctor Spock. And to, you know, <laughs> and just to just to build on what you were talking about with uh, David Measures. I mean, David Measures. David measures. Uh, yeah, David Mack was kind of pissed off about that too. He's the one that wrote that. So yeah, yeah. We and Scott and I interviewed him, and I asked him about that, and he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that they were going to change everything after I, they had me write the book." But yeah, also didn't know that they were going to reach back and and pull uh, aspects of the Section Thirty One novels and make it like the big antagonist of Season Two of Discovery. Yeah, yeah. By the way, um, a minute ago we cut to Scott and he's just like randomly suddenly holding a cat. It just, I don't know, it cracked me up and he looks like a super villain. <laughs> this is so this happens every podcast. Yeah. <laughs> this cat comes into the room up on the lap, crawls up the chest. We'll go around in about five circles on my chest before she eventually lays down. This is just the way of the podcast. I understand. I'm just gonna hit these uh hit these highlights so that we can get uh, get wrapped up but ger- basically Gerardi's eating car batteries uh to get some <laughs> stabilizing metals into her isn't that a debbie harry song so that she can uh, so that she can <laughs> assimilate people and uh and now she's caused Gerardi to murder another person um you know after she was uh exonerated from the murder that she committed last season 
you know, because she was being uh, used. Now she's being used to murder people again. And, and see, uh, that plot line, I would love to see more of that. That I think is far more interesting. Yeah. Except and for the eating, and they're just glossing over it. Except for the eating car batteries part, that felt like it was straight out of some kind of like comedy from the eighties. Like, <laughs> oh god, why is she eating car batteries? Okay. <laughs> um. So she, uh, well, she attacks them. She gets away because, well, she gets away. She runs away because Gerardi and the Queen are still kind of fighting on the inside, and Gerardi say, "You hear Gerardi yell, no!" And then she runs away. Um. And then we cut to uh, Corey leaving her dad, you know, after she gets that serum, Q gives her the serum, she takes it, now she can go out in the sunlight and everything, and she tells her dad, you know, screw you, I'm leaving, and, uh, and she leaves. And Brent Spiner did, a, I, I, I enjoyed that scene. The, both of those actors did a really good job. Mm-hmm. Now, Brent Spiner has a way of, when he's really trying to be dramatic, you know, he has a way of delivering lines, you know, and uh, he was kind of doing that thing, but it made me kind of nostalgic for the way he used to do lore and all that kind of stuff back in the day. So I, I think this was the best performance I've seen out of Spiner. Yeah, it was pretty you know, good. I, it was really good. I, I yeah. have I have said in the past and, you know, and I regret every time I say it and I regret every time I think it, you know, I, I think that he's great as data. I've never particularly liked him as anything else but this was this was really good i i really enjoyed his performances it might be oh. one of those shatter things you know how like nick meyer had to like make him do a bunch of takes until mm-hmm. he was tired yeah and well the episode he would give a subdued performance <laughs> <laughs> i can't remember the name of the episode the name the episode of tng where uh soon sends out a signal and data and lore both show data up lore? brothers data lore Oh, no, brothers. Data no, Lord. you're right. Yeah, brothers. brothers. Da- yeah. Data, data lore introduces the character of you're right. brothers, brothers is, is the, where yeah. he comes back. Yeah, he uh I think I think Brent Spiner won an Emmy for that episode because he he played all three characters, and I think he did a really good job in that episode. Um yeah. okay, so so that was uh, some terrible old age makeup, though. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it was the 90s. <laughs> that wasn't his fault, but yeah. Uh so Sung is drinking 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 away his misery, and uh the queen Everyone does. Queen Girati shows up and she kind of explains. I know it's been explained already, but she explains in a way that I think I understood a little bit more. So this Europa mission, Picard, Picard, Rene Picard is going to find something on the Europa mission that is going to cause this, this uh genealogy, this gene therapy type whatever the, this experiments that that soon is doing to become obsolete and move everything over to soon working on positronic stuff in the future and so so his, his what he's working on to be gone well will not be uh if that happens so if the europa mission is canceled if it doesn't happen then he becomes like the father of science or something like that yeah. you know? well you know we, we, we'll know he'll have that. holographic statues in the future and all that kind of stuff <laughs> We know that the Soongs continue on in genetics until Eric soon finally realizes, you know, these augments are crazy as shit. I'm going to shift to positronics in Enterprise. So, but he's just going to be like, Adam Soong is just going to be like, or whatever his name is, um, basically just kind of a footnote, just mm-hmm. trying to figure out what he's doing. And, you know, it won't be him that makes the, makes the trades as it were. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Gerardi uh, basically employs him to help her put together a, a, a task force that's going to uh, stop this mission from happening. And she starts uh, assimilating the soldiers there at the end. Um, and so using, using Soong's, what I've got written down, using Soong's resources, the queen regains the ability to assimilate other individuals into the board collective Starting with a mercenary squad assembled by Soon, the queen sets out to claim La Serena, La Serena for herself and get a huge head start on assimilating all organic life in the galaxy. So, and that was that's the that's the episode. Um, the couple of little trivia things that I have written down: uh, Seven of Nine recalls being assimilated at the age of six which was previously previously noted in the Voyager episodes, The Gift and Once Upon a Time. 
This combined with board, the board queen's statement in penance that Annika Hansen was assimilated in the year 2350 finally reveals that Seven was born in 2344 and she is 57 years old. Uh, one of the central plots in this episode is of Picard is the idea that Vulcans were, okay, that I'm going to skip that. That goes back into the whole Carbon Creek thing that we were, mm -hmm. we've already talked about that. Uh, as Seven Rafi try to track down Gerardi, composer, composer Jeff Russo liberally sprinkles in musical cues that reference Jerry Goldsmith's score from Star Trek First Contact. Love this it. is not the first time that this has happened this season, but this episode mm -hmm. easily features more prominent uses of the Borg Queen um, motifs from that Star Trek score. Mm -hmm. And what is Spearhead Operations? Uh, within Trek canon, all we know is that this is a shady group of soldiers for hire. However, within Terry Metalis's 12 Monkeys universe, Spearhead was a military organization that also funded scientific research to try and end a huge plague ravaging the earth. However, in 12 Monkeys, Spearhead is also super corrupt and led by an unethical military commander. So do Picard and 12 Monkeys share the same Spearhead? <laughs> I sure as fuck so. hope not. <laughs> I, I assume it will be just like one of those little throwaways, like on Angel when they when uh, when he mentioned that Wolfram and Hart uh, represents Waylon Utani. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> and also in Firefly, you can see like the Waylon Utani logo on some of the crates during the the Battle of oh, Serenity Valley. I need to rewatch the, Firefly. I haven't the, watched it in ages. The heads up display of the big uh, anti aircraft gun that. Uh, that he uses in the pilot episode of serenity when the when, mm -hmm. when the hud comes up and all the lights start flickering if you look in the top center if you look close you can see there's a willing yutani uh, logo that fires up well i mean you know whedon was obsessed with alien he even though he most of what he had didn't really make it to the fourth uh movie <laughs> if you look at firefly it looks like most of the ship in alien yeah. like the hangar bay and like and the, the cryopods oh, yeah. or he basically snatched the cryopods from uh from alien and stuck them in dollhouse <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and you design can, everything you can absolutely tell that alien resurrection is proto firefly just it's written all over it yeah mm -hmm. not uh, as bad a movie as it as it as it's rap wouldn't lead you to believe i didn't think resurrection was that bad. i mean it certainly got stupid towards the end with Ripley sleeping with the aliens and stuff, but, <laughs> but Sigourney Weaver had wanted to do that since the end of alien. And it was just that she finally got powerful enough to be an executive producer and say, yeah, let's do this. All right, everybody check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash infinite potato, where you will find early access to episodes and our movie commentaries, like the one that we're going to be recording in a few minutes. Uh, can't download the damn movie where we're gonna watch uh, kiss meets the uh, phantom <laughs> of the park uh you can join for three dollars a month or you can become a producer like brandon ushio dale goodall and tom corcoran that's uh being a member at the ten dollar level so go and check that out by and the way that will get you a free pass into heaven i have it on good authority oh wow that and that's i'll give you your money price. back if that's if that's not true you come and tell me it didn't happen and i will give you your money back and if you want to uh, contact the show, you can leave us a voicemail on Anchor or you can send us an email uh, or a Facebook message. To find out how to do those things, just go to our website at infinitepotato.com. Click on the link for that Star Trek podcast and you will find it. Rick, why don't you let everybody know where they can find you? You can find me pissing people off all over the internet here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but mostly on uh, Starbase 66 and Open the Iris, which I've got a really big one about to come out. We did a two-parter. Uh, I'm almost done editing. It'll be out soon. Um, also, check out our newest show, Celluloid Pudding, where Sam and Beth do an amazing job of talking about movies in a way that is both intellectual and irreverent, and they say bad words and they say lots of big words, and it's a wonderful show. Check it out. I'm going to pull the audio where Rick just said, I've got a really big one about to come out, and I don't know what <laughs> I'm going to use it for, but I'm going to use it for something. <laughs> it should just be in the opening for every episode of that Star Trek show. It would just be like him going, like, oh, I got a really big one about to come out. out. <laughs>
you know, when, when you get to my, when you get to be my age, you're rather proud of things like that. So. <laughs> All right, Scott, what about you? Uh, people can find me uh, on rare occasions these days on this show on Cosmic Potato, the Super Fan Talk podcast. Every once in a while, I try to make it on to um, Captain Game Show, which I think I might be doing later this week as of the time of this recording. Um, though I am heard uh, less frequently on podcasts these days, you can see some of my other work, uh, graphic artwork and whatnot, by visiting my website, www.planetrisecreative.com, uh, or you can follow me on Twitter at Planet Rise. I'm hoping to re-energize that Twitter account a little bit because I need to start um, reconnecting with some of my uh, old Twitter-based Star Trek fan friends as I prepare to uh, uh, boldly go to the 56-year mission Las Vegas, the big Star Trek Las Vegas convention at the end of August. My uh, admission package is already purchased. My hotel room is already reserved. I'm looking for flights. It's going to happen. I'm going Careful. to the convention. Elon's going to own Twitter soon. And, uh... no, well, that's, that, that's happening. Yeah. They announced it today. Oh, yeah. It's happening. Yeah, it's, it's done. It's no, done. Um... <laughs> no, it's done. Make, make sure you use the approved words and, and start every tweet with Hail Elon. <laughs> I refuse to believe. This is the Confederation uh, alternate uh, history is what's happening now. We are in the Confederation timeline. I No, I got to get back to the Federation. A friend of mine on Twitter today shared that news and said, there goes the neighborhood. And I said, well, to be fair, it was a shitty neighborhood in the first yeah, place. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, kind of yeah. gone to hell. <laughs> All right, Dave, what about you? Uh, well, in about uh, 10 minutes, you can find me on my own private podcast, uh, Cellulite Pudding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now, um, if you want to hear me rattle about Star Trek even more, you can listen to my podcast, uh, Star Trek Universe Podcast. If you like DC, you can we talk about the DC universe on film and television over at DC on screen. And if you like fan art, uh, uh, you can check me out on Instagram at Drawing with Dave. And that's that's what I got. His show's All right. really good, folks. Thank you, man. We Let's will be, be back. Warm. We will be back next week. Hopefully, you will join us. Episode nine in this se- is the season's uh, penultimate episode, and it is titled "Hide and Seek." Until then, thanks for being here. And remember, people really do have trouble with revolving doors. I do. <laughs> <laughs>